Mario 64. It's a classic game we all have memories about. Whether it is watching speedrunners or playing the game, we all have a love for this game. But is it what we remember? What was its development like? Was every copy personalized? Nintendo Space World, November 24, 1995, formerly named Sosinkai, showed not only the almost finalized Nintendo 64, but many monitors showing the new Mario game, Super Mario 64. At this point, it was 50% complete, and most of the differences are the textures. They only had one more year before the game was released to the public. Would Nintendo be able to complete their game in time? Let's find out. The development of Super Mario 64 began in the early 1990s, after the release of the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. At the time, the team at Nintendo was looking for new ways to push the boundaries of gaming and decided to explore possibilities of 3D gaming. The lead developer on the project, Shigeru Miyamoto, was determined to create a game that would not only take advantage of the new technology in the Super Nintendo but also be accessible to players of all ages and skill levels. To achieve this goal, the team at Nintendo had to overcome several technical challenges. One of the biggest challenges was the Super Nintendo could not handle what Miyamoto wanted to do, and there was a lack of an analog stick which would be able to control Mario better in a 3D environment. The team decided to scrap the stereoscopic Mario game and use a new and upcoming Nintendo 64, which is able to truly create 3D games. It also had a better controller with an analog stick which was requested by Miyamoto. This allowed the team to create detailed environments and characters that were not possible in traditional 2D games. The technical challenges did not stop there. The team also had to develop a new camera system that would allow players to easily explore a 3D world. They decided to use a free roaming camera system that gave players full control over the camera, allowing them to explore the world from any angle. The team also had to develop new gameplay mechanics that would take advantage of a 3D world. They introduced new moves for Mario such as long jumping, wall kicking, and swimming, which allowed players to fully explore the 3D environments. The team also introduced a new power-up system which allowed players to collect power stars to unlock new levels, which would sometimes unlock new abilities such as the Metal Cap and Vanish Cap. One of the most significant challenges in the development of Super Mario 64 was creating a non-linear game structure. The team wanted to create a game that allowed players to explore and discover new levels and challenges at their own pace, rather than following a linear path. To accomplish this, they created a hub-based structure where players could choose which levels they wanted in whatever order they chose. One of the most beloved aspects of the Mario franchise is its characters. The team at Nintendo put a lot of effort into creating memorable and likable characters, including Mario, Luigi, Princess Peach, Toad, Yoshi, Bowser, and many others, but not all of them made it into the game. The main characters include Mario, of course, Princess Peach, Toad, and Bowser. Luigi was going to be added, but it was scrapped for reasons I will get into later. After several years of development, Super Mario 64 was finally released in 1996. The game was an instant success, selling millions of copies and receiving critical acclaim. Now, this is the main summarized story, but let's get more in detail of the beta. One of the earliest games created for the Nintendo 64 platform was most likely Super Mario 64. It started as a 3D prototype on the SNES that makes use of the console's Super FX processor. However, there is no evidence of the prototype and this could be misinformation. But if it is true, I would think that it would have closely resembled Super Mario RPG, 
but we will never know unless another leak will bring this information. The 3D Mario project then made the jump to Project Reality, Nintendo's next-gen console codename, which allowed the game to progress from fake 3D to true 3D on the 64-bit console. In November 1995, the game was formally unveiled to the public. Nintendo published a lot of photographs while it was in production, some of which were from a demo that could have been played. This was crucial because it gave users the ability to capture images and videos that we may later review to determine how much the game has evolved from the beta. Let's see how it's changed. The game over in Press Start font was different and less colorful than what it was replaced with. The game also had a more colorful and cartoonish look than how it turned out to be in the final. The icons were different in the HUD and were in different places. It had a less realistic look in the beta. The power meter also changed two times before release. Big Boos used to contain keys instead of stars, which would then be added to a key counter which was scrapped. This might have unlocked doors in the mansion. The inside of Peach's castle changed a lot before the final release. The castle originally had blue walls and stars on it, which looked pretty good in my opinion. Another difference is that the stairs used to be two platforms that Mario would climb up. Cool Cool Mountain also went through a lot of changes, as seen here. Bowser used to drop a star instead of a key, and he dropped a bunch of coins with it. The developers or the coders were lazy and they really never removed the animation for the coins. Mario also had a different voice actor in the beta. Scuttlebugs, Boos, and Pokies had a texture change from beta to final. There are also unused assets in the game files, which are Blarge the Lava Dino, Small Chili Bullies, Water Mines which look like shrunken Bowser fight bombs, a Yoshi Egg, Boo Key which was scrapped but still works with hacks, Trampoline, a yellow switch and yellow box, a green and red Koopa shell, a cactus texture, a chain texture, a blue eye texture for Bowser, pink flower texture, and cracked ice texture. From a new Super Mario Bros. Wii Iwata Ask article, Mario 64 had a co-op multiplayer mode, but it was never used in the final game, and it's not clear if it could have been from the Mario 64 2 rumor, but the conversation is as states. Iwata, ever since Mario Bros., you've had your heart set on making a multiplayer Mario game. You've tried each time, but it's never quite come together. Even with Mario 64, it started with a Mario and Luigi running around together, didn't it? Miyamoto That's right. The screen was split, and they went into the castle separately. When they met in the corridor, I was incredibly happy. <laughs> then, there was also a mode where the camera was fixed, and we see Mario running away, steadily getting smaller and smaller. Iwata Yes, that's right. Miyamoto that was a remnant of an experiment we did where Mario and Luigi would run away from each other but you could still see them both. But we were unable to pull it off. Despite Luigi not being in the game, many fake guides will show you how to waste your time to unlock him. It was mostly focused in the back garden of the castle where the fountain was. The reason why was because people thought the sign on the star statue said L is real 2401. Let's look up a guide how to unlock Luigi in Super Mario 64. How to unlock Luigi in Super Mario 64. It's me, Mario! First it tells you to go to the castle courtyard, then clear up all the boos that are there. Next it tells you to ground pound both corner signs in the courtyard. Next it wants you to kick the wall above the door and ground pound right in front of the statue. 
No, I'm hearing things. There's no way that sound actually played. Dumbass. The next step is to hit the stained glass outside. The next step, well, I'll just let you watch the rest. This guy has obviously put a lot of effort into this ROM hack, and I applaud him for that, but still kind of fooled a lot of people too, and that really isn't something to be proud of. I'm not trying to be mean, it's just not nice. This ROM hack gave me more of a creepypasta vibe with all the black doors and black paintings, which we'll get onto later, but first we need to talk about glitches. Mario 64 has its fair share of glitches, but some of them are pretty unique to the game. I'll mostly just be talking about popular glitches like ones used in speedruns because there's too many I go through in this video that's 20 minutes long. For example, let's take one of the most popular glitches for this game, the BLJ, aka Backwards Long Jump. The glitch is caused by the developers forgetting to cap the backward speed of Mario. When Mario starts to BLJ on an upward slope, he lands on the ground before his speed resets, therefore adding more speed to the next jump. There's a great video on a um, tool-assisted speedrun of this game that explains it better than I can, and it also explains parallel universes better than I can. Uh, I'll have it linked in the description. Now I know some of you are wondering, what are parallel universes? Well, they're basically infinite maps of the castle or whatever map you're in. There are infinite versions of it inside and that's due to overflow variables, which is why I would much prefer you to watch the linked video. Now an easy one to understand is Bomb Clip and Nip Clip. They're both used to clip through walls in Mario 64. Nip Clip is used on the 30 star door, whereas a Bomb Clip would be used in the first level to bypass freeing the Chain Chomp, that way you can get to the star faster. The Bomb Clip is done by grabbing a bomb and jumping and letting go very fast and picking it up right before it explodes. That way the hitbox is bigger and it pushes Mario towards the direction behind him. Whereas the MIP clip, you're trying to pass a door to get to the Bowser level. Another great glitch is the invisible Bowser glitch, which is used to just have fun because there's really no use for this. For the glitch to work, you need to grab Bowser while he teleports in the second Bowser fight. He can't really do anything to you, nor can you really do anything either. It's just a fun glitch to do and impress your friends. There are also many, many, many other glitches in Super Mario 64, and I will link a website that tells you every single one. That and the Taz speedrun will be linked in the description. Now, the part I think you've all been waiting for. Mario 64 Creepypastas. When you're playing Mario 64 alone, it has an ominous feeling to it. Many will say that it gives creepy vibes, and I kind of agree, 
but there are many creepy pastas that make it even scarier. And we'll just take a look at the iceberg. On the top of the iceberg, we have please walk quietly in the hallways. This is a sign on the second floor of the castle, and it's just very odd. It just really doesn't need to be there, and it really isn't even a hallway. It's more of a big room. Maybe it was intended for another area. We just will never know. Level 2 of the iceberg. Removed courses. Unused level 1, to be precise, is the one I'm going to be talking about, since it's so ominous. It came out in the July 25th, 2020 leak, and it's a really weird level. It's really not that complete either. It's mostly a concept sketch in a skeleton. No music, just Mario. It's barely even a skybox. It is just creepy. Level 3 of the Iceberg. The Wario Apparition. First seen on Nintendo C3 1996 panel, focused on fun. One of the most famous ones. A floating Wario head in the hallway to Dire Dire Docks. This is reported to induce feelings of paranoia and trauma to any player who spots it while playing the game. This is creepy, especially for something focused on fun. If I saw this, I would never hop on Mario 64 ever again. Level 4 of the Iceberg. There will be two. The first, Shared Nightmares. Shared Nightmares is a concept which spans outside of Mario 64, and it's mostly based on conspiracy theories. People who played the game have similar nightmares as others. These nightmares relate to the haunted piano. And apparently a cereal box, Kellogg's, that really haunts me. I mean, the penguins one's really scary. It's just a better version of it. It's not even scary, it's just... It doesn't even look real. Oh, 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 bad creepy voice. Yeah, my bad, my bad. Lavender Town and Polybius were cover-ups for Mario 64. Around the time of Mario 64's release, rumors of the CIA developed an arcade game called Polybius. And I think it was put in Oregon. And it went all over the internet. It was designed to suppress the player's emotions. And it made them violent and and I think killed themselves. I'm, I'm going off of memory right now. But it was scary if you read it. And you know, black men in suits and copied data from the machine and a year after Mario 64's release, then Pokemon Red and Blue, and then Lavender Town caused psychological effects, but it really didn't, and it's, it's just a really deep rabbit hole to go into. Now, I've said everything before, from the glitches, 
beta creepy pastas. Are they real? Is this just a part of imagination? Is that cereal box really gonna haunt you? Are you going to have nightmares of the haunted piano? Or are you going to be trapped in Lavender Town in your dreams? Or will you find Polybius, play the game, and never come back? Or is Wario going to get you in the hallway of Dire Dire Docks? There's many things we don't know or don't understand. We'll never know what will really happen. Is every copy personalized? Or is it just our imagination? Or imaginations? Are we all connected? Is this the Matrix? We'll never know. We'll never find its breaking point. <laughs>